Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. Today, I'm going to begin with Mitigating Risk, Nora Hazard Series 1, Book 1 by Blaze Corvin, narrated by Emily Beresford, and a length of 7 hours and 49, 49 minutes. The streets of Bittertown could be brutal for orphaned kids, but I'd survived. Thirteen years later, I was a claw in the Jackal's gang, in charge of my own pack, and Arin was part of my pack. She could have had her own pack years ago, but she'd wanted to stay in mine. Our friend Gonal was currently in my pack, too. I knew the impulsive woman could be bad news, but Arin had had a thing for her for a while. She'd always had a terrible taste in women. This day had been like most others. We'd been loitering on Tanner Street, one of our favorite places to just bleed time. I hadn't been paying attention. Yavadne always had some story of a new conquest, and we generally believed her. She was like a venom demon on two legs, but was also still the best looking of us all. She knew it, too. And yeah, she looked sweet, but her big eyes, high cheekbones, and curly auburn hair all belonged to a killer— Yavadne had zero relax switch. I knew of at least five rival gang girls she'd probably killed, but I never said a thing. My loyalty was to the jackals, not laws. Uh, now, I make no exaggeration in stating that Delver's LLC is one of my favorite series. I mean, there's a couple out there that I cherish, and this is one of them. And I was really miffed when I learned that the master craftsman, like Blaze Corbin, had decided to shoehorn in a series between the next Delver's book, um, but I still trust that Corvin is going to craft a tale and make me happy in the end, so I went and got the first Nora Hazard book. First of all, I can see that Corvin has finally crafted a character he can appreciate. Nora is streetwise, tough as nails, and she's a knife fighter, and if you know anything about Corvin, you recognize his penchant for blades really quickly. Nora is his warrior Valkyrie maiden made flesh. The only umbrage that I had anywhere in this book came from the overly emotional reaction that Nora experiences from a loss early in the book. It really colors everything that she does, and only when she frees herself from its constraints, and I mean only then, uh, does she fully embrace her destiny and her potential. Now, of course, that is something that every character in every book has to face, but she's really just kind of overly whiny about it. And that's just a minor detail. I have to point that out because otherwise I'm not doing my job as a reviewer properly. Uh, I don't like it when something happens and it's a wine, wine, wine for a while. And that's characterization and it's building up and you understand it. But I just think if something happened like that, it wouldn't be in my head quite as much as it was hers. A minor detail, believe me. On the upside, the book itself has a ton of fantastic stuff going on, including including magical knives, superpowers, naughty drakes, evil villains, Corbin can most assuredly cast out a vivid battle scene, one full of blades, fire, and death. He also manages to bring in um, one or three faces, maybe four, um, from Delvers to help us clap out when they appear. It's a nice uh, little Easter egg for you. Nora is complex, and she is riveting as a character whom you will automatically empathize with and want to succeed. The woman's story is one of tragedy and loss, but with an unrelenting perseverance that pushes her forward, she will steal your heart. Her attitude is grit and will keep you listening as the story goes. She has grit, heart, um, sand, however you want to put it. If she was in the Old West, she would be a gunfighter that didn't know that she was shot dead. She'd still keep pulling that trigger until everybody else was gone. The final showdown between the White Shadow, you know, um, the White Darkness, no, uh, Eggshell, Eggshell, uh, whoever it is, and Nora is totally epic. Um, I only do that because it's a riff in the book. Um, and it shows just that ingenuity and the ability to keep going can be unbeatable at times. Emily Beresford does an incredible job narrating. Right now, she is in my top three or four ladies uh, for narrators. I'm going to say, like, Andrea Parsnow, uh, Emily, you've got Lori Catherine Winkle, uh, and I could name a couple more. I don't want to let anybody out. Like Annie Ellicott is there. I mean, there's a lot of, of ladies who really, really can narrate. 
and Emily is one of them, okay? She fuels every step that Nora takes with emotion and gravitas. You bleed right along with her. Your eyes water if she cries. And that's if you're a Nancy boy, just so you know. I had dust on my eyes when that happened. Um, you can feel the heat from her rage, uh, the strength in her resolve. Beresford knows how to pace a story and speed it up and slow it down all naturally. She really makes the storytelling seem effortless. Now, <clears throat> Corbin most certainly stepped out of his comfort zone to pen this amazing book, and he nails it like he was hanging a Picasso, okay? This is an excellent addition to the world of Ludus, and it really serves as a prequel to Jason and Henry arriving. Uh, if you have enjoyed Delvers, you will love Nora Hazard. If you like strong, independent female leads, you will love Nora Hazard. If you are a fan of action, adventure, magic, knife fights, sword fights, monsters, hidden dungeons, intelligent weapons, crazy priestesses, dolos orbs, well then this is a book you don't want to miss. I'm going to say my final score is an 8 out of 10 stars, just because I didn't get my Delvers book next. Sorry, Blaze. Should have done Delvers 4. I'd have been better off for it. No, I'm just kidding. 8 stars out of 10, and it's it's a really, really good read. It's a great thing to listen to. It is so enjoyable, and I really do want to see the next book come out, partly because it's a great series, and it's got a good start, but also because I know that when this series is done, I go back to Delvers again. I get to see Henry and Jason. So let's move it along, folks. 8 out of 10. Thank you. Next up is Temple of Sorrow, Stonehaven League, Book 1, by Carrie Summers. Narrated by Annie Ellicott and Jeff Hayes. The book's length is 8 hours and 30 minutes, which is really just about as good as you could ask for. It's not too long. It's not too short. This feels just like Goldilocks. It, it is just, just right. It's perfect, okay, for a length. Devin tiptoed toward the fire ring and Uraquat's throne. She really wasn't eager to strike up a conversation, much less eat the end of his club again. Fortunately, she seemed to have lost aggro when she died, meaning she was no longer the person he wanted to kill more than anything in the world. The ogre simply looked down on her, beady little eyes narrowed in a glare. His weapon leaned against the far side of the stone chair. Uroquat wore just three pieces of clothing, thick pants that ended in a ragged hem just below the knees, plus a pair of forearm guards that extended over his elbows. The armor looked well-made, and the ogre probably got a defensive bonus from his thick skin. But he didn't appear as powerful as the rest of the tribe seemed to think. She wondered what had made a group of humans decide to swear fealty to a semi-intelligent brute. You sorry for disrespect, Uroquat? The ogre said, leaning forward as he laid a hand on the club. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, she said, shuffling her feet before adding, Sorry. No more run away without paying debt. No, I'll pay first. Temple of Sorrows is a book that's made for new readers to game lit, or lit RPG stories. It has some crunch, but nothing someone coming in fresh couldn't handle. And it gives you the I'm going to build up my character blindly MC. Basically, she's an awesome gamer until Devin, the main character, enters the Relic Online game at which point she turns into such a complete noob that she knocks herself out within five minutes of entering the game. And she does just about everything wrong that she can up until she starts using her head and getting into the game. And that's why I say it's really good for a newbie to come in and read this because you get to see basically somebody who should know what you're doing, not do anything right, and have some severe consequences to it. And you get to kind of learn as she goes along and has her errors. And I think that's a perfect thing for new readers is that your, your MC, your main character makes mistakes and owns up to them because they get to learn what lit RPG is as the, the main character kind of gets to feel out the game itself. Um, once um, the main character has made her decision to actually kind of help out the area she's in uh, and be begins to make some semi intelligent to choices um it begins to flow and, and it gives the readers something they can sink their teeth into that's not overwhelming. Hardcore lit readers of lit RPG may find this a little less spicy than they like. Uh, although the book does have some action scenes, there's no real major battle that takes place here. 
everything, if you want to know about all the confrontations, even with the book's big bad, really has no teeth. I, th- I think I feel that way just because um, the main character, Devin, pretty much is an intellectual fighter. She outthinks or plans ahead. And so there's not a lot of the sword does this and this and they chop and they think and there's blood. There's not a lot of that at all. Even when she fights the the, the ogre, um, it's it's a well thought out plan that allows her to defeat somebody who's a lot stronger than her, a lot bigger than her, higher level than her. But it's it's not um, action packed. It's more intellectual packed. And I had to ch- change gears to try to get myself into that way of thinking. Um, the resolution um, is is kind of created by one swift action at the end. And you might argue with me that the scene with the tainted animals would qualify as action packed, but I'm going to disagree again. Um, I never got swept away in any of the fights and that's my big thing. I need to have a fight scene that just kind of sucks me in and I feel like I'm getting hit in the face. Okay. Um, I can compare it to, to feeling like you actually go back into the past and watch gladiatorial combats in ancient Rome and then coming back and watching professional wrestling. So that's kind of how the fight scenes feel to me. They're not as graphic or visceral as they they could have been. But it was nice seeing Devin use her head. And I'll think some of the things, but the action was really watered down and carried no weight. Story-wise, the book looks, this looks like it's going to be a lengthy series, okay? Um, Book one gets her to point A, and she's got a lot of points before she gets to Z, so I don't think this is going to be a, a two or a three book series. This looks like it could be six or seven, depending. Uh, there's a lot of things that indicate that um, as Devin has to acquire several objects in order to revive an ancient city that she's now sworn to protect. The writing is really good and it's articulate, verbose and descriptive. It's not boring. It is fun. There were some research issues that drove me a little crazy. Things that someone not familiar with animals and insects might make, such as Summers wrote that when a snake was stunned, it blinked. Well, snakes don't have eyelids, so they can't blink. So that's that. She also called spiders insects. They're arachnids. And I swear, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I literally was congratulating her in my head as I was reading um, for calling the snakes venomous and not poisonous, and then she revert, referred to the spiders as being poisonous. Um, little things like that stand out to me. Spiders have venom. They're not poisonous. Um, so, you, you know, poison dart frogs, they're poisonous, but spiders have venom. I am not a grammar Nazi or anything along those lines, but if you're going to refer to something, know how to refer to it, and research takes, like, minutes nowadays. Otherwise, the tale is pretty flawless, and I only point that out because it's something that took me out of the story as I was listening. Like I say, the story is really good, and it's intently interesting. But they kicked me out of the story. So like I say, the story is good. Character Devin is interesting. She will keep you reading. The narration by Annie Ellicott and Jeff Hayes is top-notch as always. The pair interact with each other effortlessly. I mean, it's really a treat to get to listen to them. I know I keep complaining sometimes that, you know, I like one narrator, and I really do. I really prefer one narrator for my audiobooks, but I know that Jeff has this this vision of not creating a narration, but a full-on experience with your books. And I think, and I'll be frank with you, I'm really kind of just now beginning to come around to that way of thinking. I really appreciate the sound booth does kind of go out of their way to make it more with sound effects, with numerous cast members. I like the experience. It's just taking me a little bit longer to get used to it because I've listened to so many audiobooks and 99.9% of those all have one, maybe, maybe two narrators. And so I'm going to take a little bit more time to get into this. But again, Annie and Jeff bounce each off each other so well. Um, you just, you're amazed. And, and I will say that Annie fills her voice with emotion that I don't see a lot of narrators have, male or female. Jeff, on the other hand, has a toolbox filled with different voices that he uses to reflect off of Annie's acting. I also really appreciate the production quality of this book. I really do. It had nary a hitch nor a glitch sound-wise. 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 
Is that like Pennywise's evil narrating sibling? I have to look into that. Either way, the narration really picks this book up and meshes so well with Summer's story that you just get enwrapped. And like I say, the book may not have a big payoff and it may um, not have fast action scenes, but not every book has to be brutal and visceral and blood drenched. And it doesn't have to have a battle everywhere you go. I would have liked to see, you know, a little bit more when, when the battles were taking place. But as it stands, I think the book is rock solid. It's going to be a fantastic, fantastic series. I look forward to more. My final score is 7.5, basically for the lack of a payoff, because the big bad who is defeated at the end really that's not how I would handle a confrontation. Uh, that's the only thing I'm going to say about it. Um, because it just kind of robs the listener of gratification to a certain extent. I, I think that it, it, I understand exactly why it was done, how it was done, why it was necessary and what Summers was trying to do here. But I so badly wanted to see her main character, Devin go up against the bad guy it would have just been so much more gratifying. So please, uh, honestly, Carrie, in, in the future, bear that in mind, because I really, 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 really want to see Devin strut her stuff and show how tough she really is. So lack of a payoff, no big battle scene, 7.5. Really, I'm, I'm carping a little bit. It could have been an 8, maybe higher, but I just missed a couple little things. And again, I'm not really complaining about the, the research stuff. I just want to point that out so that you can see what took me out of the story. And, and it, you know, it'll happen to me. It'll happen to other people. So 7.5, I can't say enough about the book. I really loved it. I love the character of Devin. And I know, I know, I know that everybody else that reads this book will too. So check it out. Next up, we're going to do Stuff and Nonsense, the Threadbare series, volume one by Andrew Sippel, narrated by Tim Gerard Reynolds. Uh, and the book length is 10 hours and 40 minutes. Golum animus. Nothing became something. Awareness flooded in, and suddenly, everything was. Button eyes wiggled as they looked around at a cluttered room. A furry neck moved as a cloth and fur head twisted, using its newfound ability to look at things. It didn't enjoy it. Not precisely. If you asked it and somehow gave it the ability to reply, then it could have told you that it didn't know what joy was. It didn't know much of anything. It didn't know that the hard thing it was sitting on was a wooden shelf. It failed to comprehend that the brown thingies lashed around its limbs that ran down through the holes in the wood were ropes binding it in place. It had absolutely no concept of books, which were the things that filled the shelves across the way. It couldn't tell you that the oddly shaped thing three slots down from it was a wooden hobby horse, or that the thing two slots down was a stuffed rag doll. Now, I'm sure that most of you have seen this book after getting such high praise from Whoopi Goldberg on The View. Now, that is not what brought me to this book. Uh, I had my sights set on it when I first heard it was coming out. Honestly, I kind of expected it to be similar to another book series called Teddy Bears in Monsterland, which is an urban fantasy uh, by Justin Sloan. But it wasn't. I mean, that's a great series unto itself, and I really recommend it. But this is a fairly powerful standalone story all unto itself in which the main character a golem, or golem, who happens to be a teddy bear, goes from sentience into sapience. This is book one of the series, and it was incredible. I could have done without the epilogue, though. Had it ended on the preceding chapter of the book, it would have been near perfection. And perfection's a road, it's not a destination, and this is about as close as you can get in your first attempt. Really good. The setting is really strange, and I have to say it has a distinctive feel of having been an RPG book tabletop game that somehow transitioned into a computer game simulation. There are little hints here and there as the characters discuss how things suddenly changed overnight for no particular reasons that they could fathom. So it feels like they had lived in an RPG 
tabletop setting, Dungeons and Dragons, and then suddenly it's a video game. So maybe something where, you know, Dungeons and Dragons put themselves into that kind of a situation where you have a D&D game like Neverwinter Nights. Same thing, same position, same uh, settings, and they just kind of got swept away in it. So that was a really cool concept. Uh, Threadbare, the main character, is just as adorable and cuddly as you would expect. Right up until he pops his claws and starts slashing foes like he's Freddy Krueger. I mean, for the majority of the book, he runs on pure instinct. And he's a fascinating look into the mind of a creature that slowly becomes self-aware. The one thing that threw me is that this really plays out like a book that a kid could read. And then suddenly the cursing and killing begins, and it totally throws you. Now, granted, in a book that deals with bloody kills, some cursing sh shouldn't stand out, but it does. But once you get into the book, it kind of becomes background noise, and it doesn't bother you. But it takes a little while for that to happen, and that's because of the narration, which I'll get into in just a second. Otherwise, the story is really intense. And while it does vacillate between Threadbare and his human girl and POV, the story never slows down. I mean, never. The book hits every box that you want to have hit for a fun and exciting story. The book is a crunchy lit RPG book, too. You get stats, notices, etc. It really hits every cylinder. The one thing that really sealed the deal for me was the narration by Tim Gerard Reynolds. At first, he comes across like Sebastian Cabot reading Winnie the Pooh, and I'm not kidding. I really felt that he has this very distinctive Mr. French way of speaking, and I half expected Threadbare to start thinking, tut tut, it looks like rain, tut tut, it looks like rain, or he was going to get stuck in a honey hole, so to speak, uh, which kind of does happen, okay? Um, but Reynolds has this ability to uh, morph his voice into characters on a complete spectrum of male to female and human to inhuman uh, that is so distinctive in each case and so believable that you just don't feel like it's a guy doing voices at all. He was living the parts, and that only added to the fun. I think he had played the cat better than any other character in the book. And everybody knows that cats are notoriously hard to play. <clears throat> like I say, the book is very nearly flawless, but it could have done without the epilogue. That would have been a great way to start the, the next book. The writing, the characterization, the plot, the drama, the willingness to kill characters coupled with the incredible narration make me give this book a final score of eight and three quarter stars. I mean, I really hope that Sipple can maintain the momentum that this book has got going for it. It's going to be really hard to avoid the sophomore slump because this was such a highly polished startup novel that... It's either going to go way up or way down in the next book. And I'm really anticipating way up because this is a quality tale. Give this book a big listen and enjoy a teddy bear picnic that you deserve. Like I said, final score, 8.75 stars. Next up is Supers X Heroes by Jamie Hawk. Now this is narrated by Justin Thomas James, the man with three first names, Lori Catherine Winkle, Annie Ellicott, and Jeff Hayes, Master of the Mystical Vocal Arts. The book length is five hours and 47 minutes. For the next few minutes, I followed orders until finally I came to a normal walkway, one that was carpeted and clearly hadn't been a prisoner area before this. That's when it really hit me, because not only did I see the fluorescent planet from earlier, I saw a fleet of ships, more planets beyond them, asteroids floating, and in the far distance, there was the unmistakable sight of the Milky Way. Holy hell. This was definitely not Earth or the prison I was meant to be in. The only logical explanation was that I wasn't going crazy. The voice in my head really was from some dying superhero and part of saving the galaxy. Maybe even the universe in some contributing way was up to me. Where's this lady? I asked. Are you sure you're up to it? I'm not promising to be a hero, I said. Come on, me? Against that? The guy had a head of fire. Now this book, <laughs> it really feels like a Harmon Cooper or J.A. Cipriano story melded into William D. Aran's Super Sales on Superheroes. And that's not bad, it, but it doesn't have its own distinctive voice per se. 
Uh, the story itself is a harem portal lit RPG tale about a man who was framed for murder and then abducted by aliens and placed into an intergalactic jail for super criminals. Yep. Okay. His problem is he doesn't have any powers and he makes some pretty dangerous enemies as soon as he arrives in the station. The book then turns into a survival, level up, stop the bad guy who's coming story. Um, that isn't a, that bit isn't bad, but the tale itself is really swamped by sex scenes. Now, I, I want you to get this. I'm not a prude, and I do enjoy sex scenes as much as a regular red-blooded American male anytime, any day of the week. Uh, for example, I just said I like Harmon Cooper, J.A. Cipriano, uh, M.S.E., they all have sex scenes in their books, and I don't complain about it because I expect them and I know it's there. Here I knew it was expected and I knew it was there, but there are points where the sex is just thrown in and the rest of the stuff that's going on around them is sidelined. And, and you would say to yourself, if I were a regular person, would I be having sex? And as an example, if I were on a volcanic island and the volcano was erupting and lava was coming down the mountainside, toward me and my beloved girlfriend or wife or spouse or whoever you want to call them, would I pick that moment to have sex? Okay, that's a bad bad example. Okay, but if I'm in shark-infested water, okay, and our clothes have been ripped off, would I stop to have sex? Okay, I, well, maybe I can give Hawk a break, but really, seriously. Um, there are issues with this. Um, and it really just kind of overwhelms. Now, I get why sex is important to the story, but the MC Breaker, stops to have sex every five minutes, even when he's on the clock and there is a timer counting down. Granted, there are times when the sex scene serves its purpose, but if you do a fade to black every time he had sex, you would probably shave an hour and a half off the, the book's runtime. I'm no prude and I'm not affected by sex scenes, but sometimes the story should just play out a bit more before characters engage in coitus. Like I said, in J.A. Cipriano's The Pen is Mightier 2, the MC meets a girl in Vegas and actually takes time to get to know her before they finally do the deed. Hey, uh, here it was almost like the pizza guy making a delivery in a porno. Ding dong. Hi, I got your pizza. Thanks, you want a slice? Wink, wink. And that's a real shame because Breaker and his bevy of beautiful bouncy babes are all interesting characters. Uh, and they have some pretty cool backstories that could be further expounded upon. Now, their powers are all fairly unique or at least used in new ways, and the leveling worked enough for me to consider this to be lit RPG. The real saving grace here is the audible antics provided by Sound Booth Theater. The team is on point packing heat for this one, and I can tell you they were all having fun with it. The girls really know how to turn on the naughty, and JTJ manages to make you believe he is just a regular guy simultaneously having the best and worst day of his life. Jiffy Jeff Hayes gets to play the heavy, and he knows how to bring the menace and monstrous to a character. I know I sound like a fanboy, I really do, because I am, but I know that when I have SBT as my auditory attackers, I will have been handed the best quality narration I could ask for. Again, this book could have been amazing if Hawk hadn't added, had added some more story to make up for the overwhelming sex scenes, but then they wouldn't have felt so overwhelming or broken the storyline up so much. I really think that we need to have a little more time in the prison with some added dangers and add a few more minor characters. And then, then we get the revelation about all the fighting going on. We could have met a few more fashion leaders or some characters that Breaker did not want to go out and have sex with. Um, so final score for me is a 6.5 for focusing more on sex than story or character development. If this had been more fully fleshed out, the score would have been much higher. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate you taking your time to watch or listen to the show. If you uh, want to support us, we would ask that you could go and like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. Also, I would ask if you could to please leave a comment below. I like to uh, get feedback and see how I can improve and anything I can do to make the show better. That's what I'm going to listen to. So make sure you leave a comment and I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you.